Alrighty, I'm here at CES 2020 with James Pryor from Sci-5. Um, so you may have seen previous years, I've talked to him at AMD, but he is now at Sci-5, leading the open source revolution. So, first of all, thank you for meeting with me. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, so, the first thing I'd like to ask you about is sort of your business model. So, silicon at the speed of software. Um, you talked a bit about it in your presentation just now. But what I want to know is how does this business model differ from other um, semi-custom or uh, custom solutions offered from companies like, say, ARM? Yeah, so that's a great question. So what we're looking to do is to enable domain-specific processes, so um, full SOC designs that are focused on a specific target market or use case that is unique in terms of it's not as low level as a, a pure ASIC designed to do just one thing, and it's more uh, energy efficient and higher performance than an FPGA. So really shooting that middle gap. So we do that in a number of different ways. We provide core IP based on RISC-V, designed to offer advantages in performance and efficiency and features, and it's extensible and customizable and configurable. That's a whole lot of other rules. But we're <laughs> adding all those things in there because it's really about targeting that end solution, that end customer solution. So we're making scalable generators that are able to make more than just the same core for everybody. It's configurable cores, tweaking them the last little bits to make it specifically optimized for the right workload. Now our business model means that we can license the IP for the core or for the rest of the SOC, and we can help build the chip with uh, test and verification and production capabilities as well. And it's up to you as a customer to decide where it is that you need us in your pipeline. So if you want us to do the whole chip with you, great, we can do that. If you want us to just provide the core IP and you've already got everything else lined up, then you, when you want the, uh, that core, we can do that too. And all points in between. So I think that flexibility, breadth and depth to go from core to cache to interconnect to memory control of VI interface, AI accelerators, and everything else from our partners, because we've got this design share partnership where we have tons of great IP uh, including from the recently announced SIVA partnership for DSPs, Vision, AI. That all included, making it very simple with easy and upfront costs and a pay at production model is what's different about us. Is we just, you know, I know that's a huge explanation of a business model, right, yeah. but that is end to end how mm. we're operating. And it's really simple. Right. Um, how does being uh, fully open source on every level help you achieve that? That's a great question. So. What the, the open source lets us do is, is really explain our technology simply and easily and have no worries about uh, fragmentation because we're part of a huge ecosystem with the RISC-V Foundation. So now we've got a bunch of partners, 450 companies in the RISC-V Foundation, but are all trying to make software and hardware based on RISC-V and that makes it a lot easier to have code portability, common hardware and common knowledge so that you can have a lot of that common shared experience to make better processes faster. Now the other part of open source is the ability to verify and audit what you've got. So open source specifications mean that you know what it's exactly supposed to do and you can then go off and test and verify that to be sure that it's going to do what you asked it to do. And that's really the benefit of open source. All right, and you've also done a lot of work on the software side of things with, for example, your Freedom, Freedom Studio and SDKs. So how important is it for Sci-Fi to develop software tools themselves, like, again, the Studio and the SDKs, alongside the hardware designs? Um, and how does it affect the adoption of RISC-V in the mainstream? It's very important. So it's a key focus for us to have a great software solution because we don't take the approach of here's some hardware, go figure out what to do with it to our customer. We want to find out what it is the solution they're trying to solve is and then provide everything they need to make it easy and do it right. So hitting those key you know, pieces of support, having a studio, having libraries, having compiler examples, having test plans, all of the, the board support package, everything included is key to what the customer needs to be able to do it. So that's why we provide all that stuff and we're constantly looking at how can we make it better and how can we contribute back to make sure that everybody is able to learn from this in the RISC-V Foundation. That's great. Um, so now with the newly announced U8 series of processors, or I guess cores themselves, yeah. um, one of the big focuses was the out of order execution. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the inspiration or the decision process in making an out-of-order execution processor, and how does it compare to the U7 series, which is similar except 
in order execution? Great question. Yeah, so from U7 to U8, we saw about a 1.5x improvement in efficiency with that going to that outer order. So there's a lot of things in there. It wasn't just going from in order to outer order that brought that. There's increased issue width, a higher um, number of uh, pipeline depth, which helps with frequency and uh, other optimizations. So really we're targeting that next level of performance for people who needed more performance that could come from that U7 series. So that's a really good way to get the highest level of performance um, by using that out of order architecture. Now we have the capabilities inside of there to make it deterministic. We can use some cache configuration options so that it always branches so you never have to worry about missed predictions. And you can do your own customizations to the core to adjust the depth and quality of that branch prediction. So if you want to improve it or reduce it depending on what your workload is, you have that option as well. All right. Now another focus, we've talked a lot about specific applications, AI, automated driving, 5G, things like that. Um, now, seeing as we already have uh, high-performance Linux-capable processors, how far out do you think it is um, to see general-purpose processors in, say, the server or um, personal devices? And what has to happen in order to get to that point? Oh, that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer to that one. Um, I, th I think that's a this-decade kind of answer. I, you know, I would hope it would be closer than 2029 right? Right. to make the difference, I don't know. But what needs to happen is we need to continue to evolve the support and the adoption. We've already seen FreeRTOS and Linux move to uh, RISC-V support. We now need to you know, keep moving those libraries and compilers. We've got you know, the mainstream adoption, that hard part is done, and now it's going off and finding all the extra little bits and pieces to get from 97% you know, complete to 100%. So there's a lot of work done that needs to come from the um, open source community and partners as well as sci-fi but I think it's all in play it's happening right now so it just depends on whether you see the future as being we need to change that big socket in the server to a RISC-V or we need to say you know what let's reevaluate whether a server should be a big socket and some accelerators or whether it's a different kind of view right if you, right. If you look at how um, some of the big hyperscalers are building their systems, they're not looking at the traditional componentized uh, commodity model. They're going for a more domain specific, specific focus, right? They're going for a very targeted set of accelerators you know, with TPUs and uh, you know, zip line accelerators and all that kind of stuff. They're, they're changing the focus and going for a specific solution that they're sitting the software on versus the hardware. All right. So we're starting to see a lot more major companies like Western Digital, Samsung, and now you've announced this partnership with Siva um, using RISC-V IP. So how do partnerships like these uh, set the stage, so to speak, for the future of the semiconductor industry? Um, and what does it mean for sci 5 specifically? It's fantastic news for sci 5 It shows that not only is the idea and the concept more than right, it's being adopted, and we've, we've got past that question of, well, is this going to be a thing? Yes, it's a thing. Now it's how soon are you going to join? Do you want to be left behind? Right, this is the mainstream adoption swing we're seeing right now. So, you know, the, the revolution's happened, the uprising is taking off. You should jump on board RISC V right now. Right. And then, how does this new partnership with SIVA differ, or um, how is it similar to other partnerships like Western Digital and Samsung? Uh, it's a little bit different from Western Digital and Samsung. Uh, Western Digital is a great partner. We're happy for them to use some of our IP. Uh, Samsung, a great potential partner. I hope they uh, develop an incredible range of cores based on products based on our IP as well. Siva, what we're doing is including it into our design share program. So whereas those were our partners that we were trying to work with, Siva is somebody we're going to go partner and find a new customer together with. So they're going to go and make new designs, maybe a new accelerator card, maybe a new edge endpoint device, maybe a value-powered widget or something, anything that's for computer vision, very market-focused on enablement of where those need to be. We're looking for new partners there. So we'll see you know, this year, maybe if there's some um, new wins we can talk about when they come out. Right. Now, security has been a big focus. You have the Sci-Fi Shield that you launched. Yeah. Um, how important is security at a hardware level as opposed to software level in risk 5 and how does your uh, customizability help to achieve that? Yeah, it's incredibly important. risk 5 ISA was designed with security in mind, uh, reducing the instruction sets and keeping the uh, focused um, core instructions 
very, very specific was you know, part of that security, having the PMP instructions in that core ISA, which enables a lot of the work we do inside Five Shield to operate without requiring recompilation is key, right? So having security in the hardware is, is really the only way to move forward, you, but you've got to take a holistic view from what is your solution? What does the software stack look like to support it? What does the hardware need to do to support that? All of those being configurable and customizable together is the key. So we've got a nice frozen base ISA that's tight and compact and secure. Add on top of that the specific extensions that you need for your specific workload and then secure them using a free and open secure uh, specification or you can use the Sci-Fi Shield with us to go ahead and use that to make it uh, the right security level. Now, uh, Arm recently announced that it was bringing custom instructions to some of its designs. I saw you tweeted a decent amount about that when it was happening. Um, how does it compare to Sci-Fi's own um, custom instruction extension? Uh, you know, I haven't seen the full details from them on what exactly that there is that they're doing. Um, I will say that we've been in market with custom instructions for a lot longer. We've got some great customers out there that are very excited about what we're doing. And uh, I think that the market reception shows that it's the right way. It's what the industry wants. So we're not surprised to see Arm um, adopting this. It, you know, it just shows how we're all looking and hearing the same things from customers of you know how they want to implement their next generation processes. It's not an off-the-shelf product, so that's the same as everybody else's core. They want something specific for them, not because they want to say, hey, it's my own custom core, but because we customize the core to the application to make sure that the experience is better. And that is the key driving message we're hearing from the industry. Mm -hmm. So just a few more general finalizing sure. questions. What are your expectations for Sci-5 this year, 2020? Oh wow, that's a big question. <laughs> I think I think we're going to have some great successes. We're going to get to really uh, be considered um, an ingredient brand in some of the best products available in the world. Um, I would love to see us just really break out from this uh, position where we're considered in competition with um, other smaller vendors where we can really stand on our own two feet head high as a leader in the technology space, able to create world-class IP, world-class products, and fueling and powering the, the next generation products of tomorrow. All right. What is one key area or maybe a market that you'd like to focus more of your time and energy on this year? This year is gonna be all about uh, AI-enabled products, whether it's in automotive or aerospace or in uh, mission critical or consumer or industrial IoT. This, this is the year that everyone's gonna try and design these custom SOCs that are gonna make smarter decisions faster and with lower power and with lower latency. And our portfolio and IP is, is just perfectly aligned to, to do that now. All right, and then last question, what is something you'd like to achieve in, say, the next five years? Uh, the next five years, wow, that's a, I, it's, it's a really good question. So looking at the next five years, we just want to grow and become a global brand, uh, have our products known throughout the world, with our capabilities, be part of everyday life experience and making better experiences for people using technology. And along the way, making it easier for companies to design those products, get them in the market faster, get them in the market at the right price points. That's a, that would be a great thing for us to do. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. It was a real pleasure. You're welcome. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for watching this video from CES 2020. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please make sure to leave a like and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of my content from the rest of the show. And I'll see you guys in the next one.